In this video, we are going to look at dot structure representations for molecules. And whenever we have a choice on where to put the double bond, we end up with what's called resonance structures. So I'm just going to write that. That occurs uh, when there's a choice on where to put the double bond. And I suppose it could be a triple bond as well, but that does not occur as often. So I'm going to show us a structure, formaldehyde. And if hydrogen is involved, remember hydrogen can only have two electrons maximum. So this double bond would not be able to move to this hydrogen or here. So that, we would say that that's fixed in place. And later on, uh, we'll talk about localized or delocalized bonding. So if it's fixed in place, this is localized. So for any other atom other than hydrogen, that can have eight electrons around it, then oftentimes we have a choice on where to place the double bond. So I'm going to do an example with sulfur trioxide. So if we look at SO3, if we did the needed available shared method, the needed, there's four atoms, and I'll just write that down, needed, all four atoms need eight electrons to be happy. So that gives us a 32. And since sulfur and oxygen are in the same column, the valence electrons that we're going to count are at the top of the column. So sulfur and oxygen each have six valence electrons. So the available electrons, all four atoms have six electrons. That gives us 24. That's the number that needs to be on our picture. In fact, most textbooks teach dot structures only using this number, the valence electrons from the periodic table. Here we're going to subtract. 32 minus 24 is 8 electrons. We divide by 2, and this gives us 4 lines in this structure. So the entire purpose of the needed available shared method is to come up with the number of lines so we know right away whether we have double bonds or not. So if we connect sulfur to three oxygens, we'll put sulfur in the middle. And so I'm going to start this way over here. And there's only three oxygens, so I'm going to separate them the way they would separate. And then we have a choice, so we'll just choose this oxygen here to place our double bond. And we'll quickly put the dots on the outer atoms. For the most part, we only care about the environment of the central atom. So we see that sulfur has two, four, six, eight electrons around it, so it's happy. We could place the double bond over here. So that would give us a second resonance structure, and we show that by a double-headed arrow. So now we'll put our sulfur and we'll place the double bond on that oxygen. And just to save time, I'm not going to put all the lone pairs on the outer atoms. And then we could also put the double bond to the third oxygen down here. In an earlier video, we saw that bond lengths and strengths varied whether or not the double whether the bond was a double bond, single bond or triple bond. And we can do x-ray crystallography and shoot x-rays in at a sample of SO3 or any sample and the x-rays will bounce off of the nucleus of each atom and whoever is smart enough to decipher that information can tell exactly where these atoms are with respect to each other. 
So it's known by experimentation that SO3 has three identical sulfur-oxygen bonds. So SO3 does not have two long single bonds and one shorter double bond. It has three identical SO bonds. So when we have a choice on where to place the double bond, if we write all, th all of the resonance structures available, the actual molecule is a combination of all three resonance structures. So again, this drawing of resonance structures is just for us to do some bookkeeping with. So the actual molecule is a blend, some books say that, or an average, or uh, if we stack one structure right on top of the other, we could say the real structure was a juxtaposition of all three of those, of all Lewis dot structures. And when we're looking at whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar, a lot of times we want to say, well, this is lopsided because of the double bond and two single bonds. But we want to remember that that double bond could be here or here. So we can think about the actual structure as, a, as if this double bond was continuously rotating around. But this structure would be non-polar because it is not lopsided. The sulfur has three identical things around it. There are no lone pairs on the central atom to distort that. So this is a nonpolar molecule. And if we draw all three resonance structures, it might be easier to, to see that. So the actual molecule is like uh, two-thirds single bond and one-third double bond. But instead of trying to draw that, the bond lengths would be somewhere in between a single bond length and a double bond length. So instead of trying to draw this combination of all three structures, we just show three different resonance structures. And that will be very important in the next chapter when we start talking about, uh, from hybrid orbital theory, the explanation for this double bond. On the next page, I'm going to do ozone, which is O3. So an allotrope of oxygen. Ozone, that's not the way the element occurs. But, uh, so if we look at ozone, I'm going to look at the available electrons only. So for the next few slides, I'm going to show us another method that gives us a quick dot structure. So there are three oxygen atoms. Each oxygen atom has six valence electrons available to it. So we've got 18 valence electrons from ozone. And again, that six comes from the group number. Those are the valence electrons around each atom. Since eight is our magic number, if we divide this available number of electrons by eight, so we kind of think about long division, this goes in two times, so that's going to correspond to two bonds now, so that's not lines anymore, two bonds. And then the remainder is the number of electrons on the central atom. So that's a very quick way to get the central atom's environment. So if we take the available, divide by eight, the remainder are going to be the number of dots on the central atom. So of course all three of these are O. So if we put our oxygen here and we connect the other oxygens to that, the remainder of two electrons shows up here. And we still have to know something uh, about the octet rule. So this, com this gives us two bonds and two dots, a lone pair on the central atom, but our oxygen still is not happy. So there's two, four, six electrons around it. So again, we select one side 
for that double bond to be at or we would draw both resonance structures and show the central atom, the lone pair, the O here and here. And for all practical purposes, all we care about for the next few chapters is the environment of the central atom and how many groups of electrons there are around that. So the shape of this would actually be bent like water. So our dot structure may not reflect the shape of the molecule, but that's coming up in some further videos. So all these electrons, that group and that group and that group, all the electrons are going to repel each other and maximize their angles between them. But nonetheless, if this is drawn in a linear fashion, that's fine to count groups of electrons around the central atom. So this would be a polar molecule because the central atom does not have the exact same thing around it. So remember, a polar molecule is going to be a little bit lopsided.